It's Monday. Time to catch up with Jay Lehman, our All-American linebacker, Alana Enquirer football analyst, to talk about a wild one. Jay, as Illinois scores three touchdowns in the fourth quarter to overcome a nine-point deficit. And what do you know? The cardiac kids find a way to win in the fourth quarter yet again. 38-31 over Rutgers. What a performance by Pat Bryant and Luke Altmeyer. But what a what an unbelievable finish, Jay, and what has been a season of unbelievable finishes for this team. And so here's what here's what I want to open up with. There's a little bit of luck that that needs to happen sure. for you to win a lot of these close games, like Greg Schiano calling timeout, right? But there's also got to be some skill at some point, right? Because Illinois was four and eight in one score games their first couple first two years with Brett Bioma. They're nine and four in one score games the last two seasons, including four and one this year. So what is the balance of luck and skill? And finding a way to win these games. Well, and I would just say mindset. I think when you come from a program of we lose, we're in the bottom up half of the Big Ten, bottom third, and we're not supposed to be in this game. And if we're close, I'm not saying it's a moral victory, but hey, we played good and we tried. And now I believe there's a mindset shift of like, we believe that we're going to win this game. And when it's close, we believe we have the playmakers on our side to make it happen. And so I think that's a huge mindset shift. I give Brett Bielema, Barry Lunny, and Aaron Henry a lot of credit for that. You know, I think Brett mentioned in his press conference where Barry was talking to Luke saying, hey, we're built for this. We're built to come back, right? And uh, that's coaching, that's faith, that that's a mindset thing. And then number two, we said all the time, when you have a quarterback, you have a chance. And uh, uh, Luke Waltmeyer certainly had uh, more ups than downs this season. He had a two or three game stretch. We didn't know if he was playing his best. One thing you can't argue with is, He has played his best in the most critical of times, whether it be Purdue, Nebraska, uh, Michigan State, and now Rutgers uh, with the Illinois offense scoring touchdowns on their last four drives. That is a very, very impressive stat to win this game and outscore Rutgers in the fourth quarter. And none better than the fourth and 13 where he stepped up in the face of pressure and threw that football big time throw at a big time moment in the game. Yeah, in the fourth quarter, Jay, Luke Altmaier, 151 passing yards. Pat Bryan had something to do with that, of course, but 60 rushing yards. And as you said, four straight touchdown drives, three in the fourth quarter. What is it about Luke in those moments to where you think he rises to the occasion? One, I think that he's a guy that he's experienced. So I think nothing, nothing rattles him as far as him going to the tank. We saw that last year with the Penn State game, gets pulled late uh, for Paddock. Uh, he's had some ups and downs. So number one, he's experienced. Number two, um, he's he's got a lot of trust in what Barry Lunny's calling. Number three, he's got Pat Bryant. And I think when you have a safety valve like Pat Bryant, uh, there's been so many years Illinois has not had a guy that can go get you a play or make a play out of nothing. He took a hitch route, a little curl route for 60 yards. I mean, he made two or three guys miss. It was not just bombs and he catches jump balls. His run after the catch has really been good this year, uh, physical running. And so you got a guy like Pat Bryant who everybody in the stadium knows where it's going to. He's got a lot of chemistry with Pat Bryant. And I think that helps immensely. And uh, it helps when you're the guy. There's nobody looking over his shoulder that he's going to get pulled out. He can wing it. He can sling it and know that he's going to be out there the next series. One of the most impressive performances I've ever seen from an Illini wide receiver. Jay, oh, Pat yeah. Bryant, 140 of his 197 yards came in the fourth quarter. He had 136 yards after the catch in this game. Like, that's a good game by itself. That's just after the catch. Right. Um, what made Saturday's performance with Pat Bryant so special and just what makes this guy so special? Well, I think his ability to feel the moment and make critical plays at critical times. I'll just go through some of the Big Ten games where he's made some big plays. I mean – um, Nebraska made a big play early in that game, also had a touchdown catch uh, late in that game, uh, I think in overtime, where they yeah. snuck him in at fullback. Purdue. He's got three game-winning touchdowns this year, Jay. That, that's incredible. Purdue, if you run, not just the overtime catch, but he had a catch in that 45-second drive to put it into overtime down the sideline for 30 yards. Uh, that was a real critical catch. You look at Michigan State, I, I felt like the game was in doubt, 24-16 with about 12 minutes to play. And uh, they ran the same play, honestly, that they ran against Rutgers, which was the deep dig route, slow developing play. You've got to protect Luke on that play. And he had a big gain to turn that game around. And then you look at Rutgers, what he did. So number one, he's very, very clutch. Number two, 
he's improved his hands. Uh, uh, you know, I think that was uh, – you look at the Indiana game two years ago, the Minnesota game last year. He had some critical drops. That has not been the case for Pat Bryant. He's been – I know we're catching 50 balls before every practice. I know his routine's dialed in. Um, so his hands have taken the next level. Number three, he really is a complete football player from blocking uh, uh, leadership, from catching the ball, running after the catch, and getting open when everybody knows you're going to get the ball. I mean, that's very, very difficult to do, especially when Zakari Franklin out with an injury. You do have Colin Dixon. You had Beatty make a catch or two. But really, everybody knew in the clutch moment, your Rutgers fans, guard number 13. And they did not do it, which was shocking. He even caused some pass interferences late that don't show up. And that's a critical time as well to a critical moment in the game when he gets some pass interference calls. Yeah, can I throw another stat at you? Because it's just unbelievable. Pat Bryant was targeted 12 times in the uh, fourth quarter, six, 12 of the 16 targets of Luke Altmaier, what he threw. So everyone knows it's going to him. He still had 140 receiving yards and drew 35 yards in penalties in, in that fourth quarter, Jay. Like, I, I don't know how Rutgers, like, how did he get open? Like, how did Rutgers allow him to get open? I don't and then know. Not tackle. So I, I, I first, of, first and foremost, I, I'm not sure. There are some routes where Pat just beat his guy. Okay, and he and he does beat his guy. He's strong. He's a good route runner. Kind of an underrated aspect of him. He's very crisp on his routes and goes up and gets it. Um, as far as the fourth down play, uh, I've looked at that play a number of times. Um, so it was a 30-second timeout, I believe, from the time they kicked it to when they switched it. I'm surprised Rutgers, when we came out offensively, didn't call a timeout at that point just to get ready because I don't know. They had the field goal block coming off, and then which would be different than maybe their defense that was in. And I would say that a, a fourth and 13, it happens so fast. I know where you're watching on TV. You guys see the scoreboard all the time. But you're in a game, and it almost felt like it was supposed to be a Hail Mary play. Yeah. But it wasn't a Hail Mary play. And if you look at the way they play defense, it was a little bit of a Hail Mary play, which um, will always be soft in that 10 to 20-yard range, right? And so they ran the deep dig, which is a slow-developing play because you have Pat at the outside receiver position. He's got to get all the way to the middle of the field and let Kapka Jones and Beatty clear so that he comes underneath. It looked like they were in that like Hail Mary defense, and it was the wrong call because it was really fourth and 13. I know there was no timeouts. When he caught the ball, it's an interesting story. I'm actually at the Maryland Eastern Shore game. <laughs> I walk in with like a minute – to go, uh, you know, into the assembly hall. Of course, the Wi-Fi takes over. My phone goes out. Then I got to get back on everything else with the Wi-Fi. I get back on. And when Pat catches that ball, what's crazy is everybody in the assembly hall kind of catches on that Illinois is, you know, going to win because uh, they're watching on their phones. And uh, I'm yelling, get down, get down, get down. Then I'm yelling, go, go, go. Uh, and so it's just a, it's an exciting moment right there. Yeah, um, and he made, he made that corner miss. The corner missed him. Colin Dixon throws a block and gets in the end zone. Uh, yeah, just amazing. There were, were some bad angles. I think I think those DBs might have failed geometry because the angles on that last play were, were wretched. And that was a teach tape of how to take wrong angles uh, on a on a player. Yeah, and Luke Altmaier making that throw with the guy in his face. Um, oh my! God. Just, he just stepped great. into that throw. He knew he was going to take a shot. Luke probably didn't know that was a touchdown until he got up. Yeah, uh, because. <laughs> Because he got walloped by, I believe, 71 uh, Edwards or somebody like that just walloped him. Yeah. And it was it was brutal. So what's Barry Oney Jr.'s role in all of this? Where this offense, like in the fourth quarter and really when it gets up tempo, Jay, they, they just – they find another level. You know, I, I think Barry is a guy that has really done a, a great job of sucking in Brett's need to run the football and be physical and we're a big 10 football team with his head love to air it out and throw the football down the field. And that balance has been a really good marriage. But what I like about Lunny is he seems to have a knack to know what to call for what we need in the moment, right? He's not just going to hit the home run every play, but what do we need in the moment? And what I liked is even without one of his best playmakers really in the second half, Zakari Franklin, he was still able to manufacture offense in the pass game. And what you'll see is it was hard to get it to our wide receivers early in that football game. You go back to the first quarter. And so he'll manufacture, manufacture stuff uh, in, to get Pat Bryant in the flat, to let him run after the catch. Zakari in the flat 
to get him. We see, I saw watching the Rams last night. We saw Matthew Stafford do this with his receivers. Get guys in the flat, get guys move, get your guys in space to get the ball to kind of get them going. So he's done a tremendous job of that. He's also done a good job of not abandoning the run. I have to give him credit for that. It, it, there's been a lot of people just said, just throw everything. Oh, we've started to run the ball better. We saw Aiden Lawfrey pop some. We saw McCray at times run the football great. Not, not awesome. We see Luke Altmaier also pop off that big run on the missed assignment. And so he hasn't necessarily abandoned those things. And I think for a team like Illinois in the conference we play in, he's done a great job of getting Brett Bielema's vision, but also having that downfield attack that we haven't had in so many years. A lot of that is run after the catch, but a lot of that is play designed to get Pat Bryant in space. I know Melvin Priestley had some some key penalties that, that really hurt Illinois, but you, you sent me a no, Jay, of what you want to talk about. It's, it's that the offensive line has played better, and, and maybe yeah. it's the yeah. opponent. Yeah. Um, you know, the last two weeks, Michigan State Rutgers are, are great pass rushing, but it just feels like Luke's had time, and you give Luke and Pat Bryant time and Zachary Franklin time, they're going to make you pay. So uh, maybe it's just the opponent, but against some of these middle-tier, lower-tier opponents, I, I feel like the offensive line – is starting to find a little bit of a groove, especially J.C. Davis and Josh Cruz. Yeah, I, I, J.C. Davis and Josh Cruz have probably been your most consistent on the back end. I think Melvin Priestley, he didn't have his best game and you know had some hurtful penalties, some some post post uh, whistle penalties as well. Um, and, and people see that. It's very obvious on offensive linemen when they make a mistake. He gave up that sack late in the game as well. It wasn't Priestley's best game. Do I think he's been a great addition in the portal? 100%. He has not even been challenged really at that right tackle position uh, where in the guards we've had kind of a, a revolving door. And so I think we got to give credit. We, we've we criticized them through the first six games, but I've seen them get better. In, in, in they've been more consistent. We still have too many negative plays, you know, a negative one play, a negative two plays, and we get behind the chains, unlike Rutgers, who was always ahead of the chains with Kyle Manungai and their run attack. But what I'm seeing is with our best back out, who I would say is Caden Fagan, we have seen some progress and it's been enough to not just say, Hey, we're going to air out everything and we can control clock. We can eat up the clock. And Josh McCray continues to play at a very high level. I, I think Khalil Valentine shows a little bit different burst too. I think next year we'll get to see what he does as well. His burst through the line, he was close to breaking one. I think he's a unique subset that's really missing in the run game uh, and for this offense that Lenny's going to take advantage of. Yeah, once he gets under that squat bar, Jay, right? Just right. break through those second-level tackles. Like, he's going right. to break one. Uh, no, it's no, just absolutely. Never yet. Yeah. absolutely. What, I, what I've liked, though, is that uh, offensive line-wise, I feel like we've actually gotten to the second level at times. When we actually get our guys and we don't get beat directly off the line of scrimmage for a negative two loss, we get to the second level. It's allowed what, – what's made Josh the number one running back, in my opinion – I know Aiden Lawfrey might have started the game, uh, is that Josh is the one guy that breaks tackles consistently. He will break a tackle, not with a juke or anything, but he just has enough strength to break a tackle. And I think that's really critical in, in college football. You're going to have a free, free defender to make a play. Can your running back make him miss, right? Now, he can't make two or three guys miss, which has been the case on some run plays, but can he make one guy miss by breaking a tackle? And Josh McCray's done that the last three games. His pass blocking is superb. He played that last play too, right? I mean, he's um, one thing about one thing you'll notice about a good running back when they pass block is they're not in a hurry, right? They rarely take the first move from a linebacker or what, and uh, he's not in a hurry, uh, and so they usually come right back to him. And he's been great as, as well as Tanner Arkin in some of these deeper routes where we max protect as well to get six or seven guys protecting to let Pat Bryant get the ball on a deep dig route. At the end of that game, you're without Zachary Franklin. Malik Elzey uh, isn't able to play due to injury. But Alex Kapka Jones threw a couple big blocks there. Colin Dixon with a big catch in, in the fourth quarter of that last drive and a big block. But Hank Beatty is starting to show up, not only on special teams, but starting to show up as <clears throat> a wide receiver. Dre, uh, Jay, he had that great break off a route for his first career touchdown. <clears throat> and then a big contested catch. Ball was kind of thrown behind him, but you're starting to see that he's got some trust from Luke Altmaier. And that, that could be huge going into next year when you need some guys to step up. Well, there's a reason he was a Gatorade Player of the Year in the state of Illinois, right? Played a great program in Rochester, uh, I believe under Derek Leonard. And, you know, you could see that he's he's well coached up. He's really found his niche. 
And confidence, I think, is a punt returner, which we saw that, again, be, be a game-changing thing. I know it was only three points, but just flipping the field like he did. But I think that you could see Hank Beatty um, have an Isaiah Williams-like season next year in the slot. I really do. I don't know if he'll – he's never going to be as sudden as him, but he's got a little bit more power than Isaiah when he runs. And so I think you got him, and I, I think he could be a huge piece to Luke and, and what he's going to be next year. And then you've got to say, who's the who's the guy that's going to take this up? You think Malik, uh, who they're high on. I, I really like Kapka Jones when I saw him play in the spring game. Made a great effort on that ball. Almost brought down that ball in the game against Rutgers. And he has some straight line speed that maybe we lack a little bit. It seems like he can really move. Ashton Hollins was banged up. You hope you get him back as well. And so you have bodies there. You're probably going to go out in the portal when you have two big starters leave and say, hey, we had all these starters leave. Can we get a guy to come and play for Luke uh, in his senior season? But Hank Beatty been super impressive offensively and special teams. I think he's he's got to be almost. I know I know he doesn't have a touchdown yet, but he's got to be first team All Big Ten punt returner. Yeah, I, I totally agree with that. You guys have heard me talk up Home Field Apparel for a while now, but now is the time to get to homefieldapparel.com because they have their most ambitious sale to date, their Black Friday sale. 30% off site-wide on everything at Home Field Apparel, which is the premium collegiate apparel brand, and they're based right out of Indianapolis. Go to homefieldapparel.com, look up their Illinois gear, guys. They got script Illini gear, flying Illini gear. Their bomber jacket is phenomenal. Uh, they just have everything vintage. Everything looks great. All these great logos goes from Illinois' past, even some hockey gear on there as well. And now is the time to go there because their Black Friday sale is great. 30% off a whole site at homefieldapparel.com. Just use code BFCM24. That's BFCM24 for 30% off site-wide at homefieldapparel.com. If you have an Illini fan in your life that you need a gift for, Go to homefieldapparel.com and check out some of the great Illini gear. My personal favorite is the Flying Illini logo. They have a hoodie. They have a t-shirt. And the great things about these shirts, they're great fitting, and they are so comfortable, guys. So go check it out. Homefieldapparel.com, 30% off their Black Friday sale. Go to homefieldapparel.com and use coupon code BFCM24, and you get 30% off now through December 3rd at homefieldapparel.com. Let's flip to the defense, Jay. There was some good here. Like Kyle Manungai, 4.4 yards per carry. I'll take that, right? Like, we're in a lot of explosives from him. Ethan Kaliak, man, is 4.7 yards per pass attempt. You'll take that every game. But the quarterback run was an issue for both sides here, right? Um, but it was obviously Rucker's best weapon. And Illinois just couldn't uh, keep them off the field because of yeah. Kaliak, man, it's a scramble. What is the key, especially when you're going man defense, to, to defending that? Or what was the issue for Illinois? Well, I, I think what, what's difficult is you take a super aggressive player like Gabe Backus and you try to throw all kinds of stuff at him and say, oh, we may pass it or we may just do quarterback run, which is tough on a guy like Gabe, right? Who uh, Gabe is a powerful defensive end. He's not necessarily a guy you want trying to tackle in space on a guy. That's just not who he is. Um, and so they did a little bit of that. Um, we, we seem to really struggle on the guy's that are kind of sneaky with the quarterback run, like a like a Ryan Brown or like a um, uh, or, or like Ethan Kelly Manis. We're like we really didn't, we didn't struggle against Jalen Daniels on Kansas, right? And they had some quarterback run in there. Um, so I think a lot of it is is one. It's been shown as a weakness. Any quarterback, whether they're mobile or not, labeled as mobile or not, we got to be ready for it. Number two is we've also got to help more with the linebacker position. I think the linebackers played better, right? But uh, and I think James Cruz had a better game. He's improved. I think Ryan Mead has got better and better and better. Yeah. So I think the linebackers have improved. But linebackers are also and the nickel are guys that will clean up that quarterback run. The problem is um, the is if you're in man coverage, you got a linebacker going with Manungai going that way, the opposite way of quarterback run. And you've also got you also had no tight end uh, in because their tight ends were hurt for the most part. So Cole Dremel was playing tight end, which then you're guarding a receiver and you're trying to help out on the quarterback where I think if they had a tight end in the game, you, he would have been more in line or in that H back position. 
you get another guy in the box. But when they went 10 personnel, basically, with four wide receivers, one back, you get spread out more, and Dremel's doing all this motion. I'm watching him, and now it's one-on-one with Ethan Kelly Manis. That's a lot of scheme right there. I hope you followed it. But it does make a difference because when that tight end's in the line or on the line, I've got a man-to-man, and I can also play run defense from my alignment. Defensive front, not their best game, Jay. No, right? like, not enough pressure. We're, we're, yeah, where where did this group struggle? I, I still feel like that second unit, man. It feels still feels like they're just a year away. Yeah, um, the, uh, well, I, I give credit to Tira Edwards. He made some. He's continued to improve. I will say, Tira showed some. I saw Dennis Briggs late in that game. And one thing I like about Briggs is uh, I've never seen him just get blown up. I mean, he might not make every play, but he's very he's more stout in there for his size than people give him credit for. You thought that Gabe. Uh, we, we've just become accustomed to Gabe being a game wrecker. He just wasn't in this game. And they had a lot of chips on him. They were they were making sure they were ready for our Texas stuff where we bring him in and whatnot. And then I know Seth Coleman got banged up, you know, late in the game. And it, it feels like this team is missing a, a true speed rusher that maybe Daniel Brown could have been, that Kanina Odaluga can be at times, right? It seems like we have power, but – but not, not maybe not that speed rusher to really take advantage of a guy like Holland Pierce, who's a big guy, but certainly can't move great for, for the Rutgers. And so we, we miss that kind of speed rusher in there. And we don't bring linebackers a lot when we blitz, right? So uh, so that that's kind of the issue with this defensive line and certainly did not get enough uh, on, on the um, – did not get enough on the pass rush. But I will say on running back runs, just like in Michigan State, they were decent at the point of attack. All right, linebacker play, Jay. We're pretty concerned when Don Rosiak goes out. But yeah. James Cruz, I thought, had one of the better linebacker games of the season. You mentioned Meade getting better, but I'll throw Matthew Bailey in there as well. As oh, you yeah. said, a lot of end personnel. And uh, I just thought he cleaned up a, a lot of things. So uh, that, that group has just been way better than I thought the last two weeks. I think James Cruz is healthier. I mean, even uh, Brett mentioned that, hey, he got his thumb back to kind of get off blocks. It's, it's incredibly difficult to play – linebacker with an injured hand. I can I can attest to it. Or even an injured thumb. Try to get your hands or your weapons to get off 300-pound linemen. Without them, it's very difficult. Okay. Uh, I, when Malachi Hunt gets it, he didn't get in as much. Um, am I giving you a feedback right here? No, you're good. Okay. Um, when Malachi Hunt got it, it wasn't, wasn't that. Ryan Mead has been super consistent as far as uh, doing his job, having some girth in the middle of the field, and so I, I've, I've really liked what I've seen. But Matthew Bailey, the, they asked the strong safety to do a lot in this defense. Play in the box, also cover people. Um, you know, Brett kind of made a joke. I wasn't sure he'd be able to cover Got some of the guys that he was covering today. And so I think he's gotten better at coverage. I think he's gotten better at, uh, at playing. In, he's always been a great in-the-box player, but you feel like his awareness – his ability not to get fooled, not to get tricked, which happened in midseason on some of the stuff they ran uh, against other opponents, is getting better and better and had a huge cause fumble against Ethan Kelly and Manis, you know, with them kind of in that alumni zone around the 40. That was huge. I think I think Matthew Bailey can all be an all Big Ten player next year. It's kind of the guy that you got to say, that's a recruiting win, a guy that you went and got in state at Moline. And not a lot of guys go after him, but gets on the field relatively early, battles through an injury, and has two more years to play. Miles Scott, I thought, really struggled as a tackler in this one. I was wondering if Resetich would get a longer look in this one. But, Jay, I, I, I know the corners were giving up size, and, and Rutgers won some of those, but they competed, man. And, and I thought Xavier Scott was inches away from really changing this game. Uh, I thought he was really, really good. So I, I know it wasn't the cleanest game for the secondary, but, man, I thought they competed against those big wideouts. Yeah, it's almost like you'd think that Xavier Scott's probably the best corner we have, but we really need him at nickel right now. Uh, because of just the way the pressure on the nickel back is immense. I know people may think he's just an extra guy, but we've talked about this. The, the nickels have to make plays, and they've got a lot of decisions. When you're a corner, you are on an island, and you've got to compete against guys that are bigger than you usually at the receiver position, which Strong certainly was bigger than some of us. I like that we battled. Um, we, we are a little bit undersized there. Um, uh, juice – you know, uh, Jaheim Clark, whatever they call him, Juice. I mean, he battled some. Torrey Cox never seems to be out of position. He's small. And Caleb Patterson battled. So uh, I think we're we're getting some depth there. We certainly don't have a Devin Witherspoon type guy there. But 
we are battling and you don't see guys just wide open like we've seen three, four years ago. That has not been the case. Right. We're battling and, and winning our fair share of plays. Beatty obviously had that big return, but this was kind of a tough day for the special teams with the win, Jay. Uh, it looked like a bad snap that led to a bad kick on the extra point. You're chasing that one. The punting uh, wasn't great, but, uh, you know, Rucker seemed to handle that a little bit better. Uh, just yeah, that win. Yeah, yeah there, was a, there was a lot of wind. Uh, I thought Memorial Stadium was the worst wind in the Big Ten. Maybe Rutgers is even, is even worse. It's always been super cold when I go there just – it feels like it's it's like that. Other than the time I got beat there in September when it was hot, but every time I've called a game there, and um, it's it's not a tough place to win. There's kind of a, it, 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 I mean, I mean, it's not a tough place. It's a, it is a tough place to win. Uh, Rutgers kind of gets in the in that mode, and I think they handled the special teams better. But Greg's kind of known for that. Shiano's gonna gonna be good in special teams, be good on defense, and the way the game was going when it was seventeen nine, I was like, this is going exactly the way Rutgers wants it to go, and Two they kickoffs can, out of bounds too, like that. Oh yeah, the kickoffs out of bounds, especially on the last, the last drive that Rutgers had to yeah. start out with a kickoff out of bounds. We just, we just haven't had that. I, the kicking game has not been as strong the last two weeks as you, you'd like it to be. The return game has been really, really strong with Hank Beatty. Well, Jay, what's this win mean? Uh, you know, just to turn this into a win rather than you know losing thirty-one thirty at the end and missing that field goal. Like, what's it mean to get Pat Bryan in the end zone? Oh, it's just huge from a big picture. I think eight wins is a big deal. A winning Big Ten season, a chance to win nine wins with the with your in-state rival on on deck. But it, it goes back to we expect as a program and as fans to win. I think that's huge. I think it hasn't always been that way. Uh, it hasn't always. It's always like okay, this is Illinois football. The shoe's going to drop. You now I remember even the Kansas game where Reset has dropped the fumble, being in the stands, and people were like, "Up." Oh, Drop the punt. Uh, here we go again, right? There's always something. And Illinois has broken that. That's an extremely hard mindset to break. And Illinois has done that. And they've done it. On a, they're consistent. They're competitive. And, guys, if you go to the Citrus Bowl, you're considered the fifth best team in the Big Ten if four teams go to the playoff. We're in the upper third of the Big Ten. I know you might say Iowa's a little bit down. Wisconsin certainly down. But who cares? We, we, we've beat some good teams. And, you know, we played, a, 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 I would say, a fairly hard schedule. I mean, Kansas is looking like a better and better non-con opponent with what they've been doing lately. You play Penn State at Penn State. You play Oregon at Oregon. Uh, you, you did book the defending national champions at home, right? And you, and, and you beat them. I know they're down. But you played a hard schedule and you have nine wins. We should be doing cartwheels right now. And I think you got to capitalize on this and say, let's keep the momentum going recruiting-wise. And also have a good showing in the bowl game. Agreed with you. All right, you still got one more regular season game though, Jay. Uh, Northwestern just coming off a fifty to six loss at Michigan. They are sixteenth place uh, in the Big Ten at four and seven, two and seven in the conference. What are keys to bringing that hat home and, and taking care of business and getting a ninth win in a season for just the eighth time in program history? So Northwestern's pesky. We know this, right? But uh, I would say the biggest key is. If Luke Altmeyer plays well, we're going to win this game. If Luke Altmeyer has turnovers and fumbles and whatnot, it's going to be a game. But but Luke is really the difference maker for this football team. Illinois is not better than – not leaps and bounds better than anybody that they play. Okay, So they can't go out there and be bad on special teams, turn the ball over, and not be great in the red zone. I will say, Illinois, great in the red zone. I, you got to give credit to Barry Lunny. Uh, finishing drives in the red zone, and more often than not, other than after the punt return, getting touchdowns in the red zone. That is a big thing. So, again, all games come down to turnovers, third down, red zone, special teams, all those things we talk about, running the ball, stopping the run, yes. But I, we're a better team athletically than this team. We've got more horses in the stable. We've got more depth. We've certainly got a better quarterback. We should win this team, beat this team. I think you play this game ten times, you win eight or nine times. You just hope it's not that one or two times – that they come out and they play above their level, we play below our level, and you're in a dogfight in the third and fourth quarter. But it is a rivalry game. It is their bowl game for Northwestern. They got nothing else to play for, nothing else to do. So they're going to give you their best shot. And so I think that's the that's the tricky part. But Brett has had this team ready every game. I haven't thought there has been a game other than Minnesota and maybe Oregon where you thought, eh, were they really ready? Were they there mentally? Um, I think Brett will have them ready. 
in containing Lausch's run, right? That's that's the biggest thing. Just make him a passer, I would imagine. I would say so. I mean, he he's that that's but all they've done, right? I mean, is, is this kind of and so and obviously that's been a weakness for Illinois. So I would say that. I mean, Northwestern's been so bad. I've hardly watched them. I watched them early in the year against 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 Eastern, and I've watched some of their their offense, which they've switched up, and their defense. I, I, listen, they look more like the Northwestern of not last year, but of of the two years prior to that, where they were just struggling to get any kind of offense going, and the defense has been kind of ho hum. So you, you hope that Brett uh, can, can kind of finish the job. And you win by two or three touchdowns, but rivalry games can always be tricky. All right, Jay, as a former Alana, what is this rivalry like? Again, yeah, so yeah. it's funny because a lot of people, you know, growing up, you feel like you want to beat Michigan and Ohio State just because they're the biggest and the baddest, right? But the rivalry for those two teams is between each other, not with Illinois, right? And so uh I think what's been what's been tough is that since I kind of came into football consciousness, which I'll say it was around 1994, 1995, uh, when I was nine or 10 years old, Northwestern's been pretty darn good. You know, uh, they, 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 they've won a uh, couple of big 10 championships there in the mid nineties and Zach Kustak won one in the year 2000 and uh, nor- had unprecedented success with Pat Fitzgerald who won over a hundred games there uh, from, from 06 to, you know, 2022 basically. And, so they've been more consistent and better than us where I think until the mid nineties, that was, they were always worse than us. So it feels like it had flipped a little bit and now it feels like Illinois is a better football team and in a better position. And I will tell you that this game does mean a lot to the Illinois football players, especially from the state of Illinois. Uh, some guys get recruited by Northwestern and not Illinois. Some guys get recruited by Illinois and not Northwestern. Some guys get recruited by both. So I think it means a lot. These are in-state rival. Uh, you definitely want to clear up and say you're the best team in the state, although we're not playing Northern Illinois, so we don't know. But um, uh, it, it does mean a lot. Do I think it's the juiciest of rivals? No, I don't. But it is a rivalry. There's a trophy on the line. and They're a team we're going to play every year with the current conference setup. All right, Jay, I just want to do a couple quick hitters with you with the Big Ten. Indiana gets bludgeoned by Ohio State, kind of a, a back-to-reality moment for them. Oh, cool. But, I mean, they had to be so happy about all the chaos that happened in the SEC. Sure. They still feel like they take care of business against Purdue that, that they're in. I think they're in. I mean, you're telling me that you're going to put Alabama in there after they just got beat by a bad Oklahoma team, 24-3? to They've also gotten beat by Vanderbilt, okay? Uh, they might be the best. I might take this back someday, but they might be a good matchup for Illinois with some of the – some of the, compared to Georgia, right? Maybe. Um uh, I think Jalen Miller was still dynamic running the football and they got athletes all over the place, but uh, and then Ole Miss loses as well. And, and Texas A&M could lose this week against Texas and have three losses. And so the chaos helps, but I do think it was a, a back to reality moment for Indiana. Really? What did it come down to? It came down to special teams and turnovers. That's really the game, right? They dropped a, dropped a snap and they gave up a punt return for a touchdown and so many times in those games, it does come down to that. He also said the sound, and they had not been in an environment like that all year. And it is very difficult to go into Ohio State with the sound and, and get a win against a good football team like that. So it, uh, it doesn't take away to, for me what Coach Signetti's done. I think they're still a playoff team. In fact, he won't even answer that question because it's so obvious. Yeah. Um, you talk a big game, you got to answer some questions, man. It's a I, fair question. I, I, I would answer the question and say, absolutely. Look at our body of work. We've blown people out. We haven't just beat people. Right. We beat people handily. I, I don't think it was a bad question at all, right? Yeah. So to just say yes, make your statement for your team. Um, so I didn't necessarily agree with that. I, I think they'll blow out Purdue. Man, Purdue, 0-10 mm-hmm. against FBS opponents, Jay, and they got Indiana next, an Indiana team that's going to be angry. Um, just a – just a disaster of a year for Ryan Walters. I, I don't know how he survives other than money. And I just, if you're Purdue, man, it, it, is it going to be more costly not to do something right now? Because what can you do in recruiting? What can you do in a year three against a tough schedule? It, that's a tough spot for Purdue just two years into that tenure. Well, I, I think the name of the game is progress when you're building a program. If you continue to have progress, we saw this with Ron Zook. You know, Ron only won two games in 2006, but he was close. And he was starting to get guys on campus that were difference makers that you thought, okay, we can see this. You know, Ryan Walters, 
picked up a couple guys in the portal, but lost a ton of guys in the portal. I know we had some massive recruiting wins uh, in, in the spring. A lot of those guys have decommitted. And so now you're at the point now, can we even get the guys we want here as long as Ryan Walters is the coach? And it seems like, and, and I just follow from afar and, and, and read what I read, that there's massive momentum and uh, desire to have a change at the top. It seems like that when you read Twitter or listen to people or get close to people that cover this, he, uh, Purdue is, they, they know they're not, they, they know they're not Ohio state, but this has been a consistent thorn in the side of Illinois and other big 10 programs because they've been pesky on offense and at least been competitive. They are not that right now. And do I think Ryan Walters is a good football coach? Yes. Was he ready to take on a, a, a Purdue head coaching job? Uh, there's a lot of different factors that go to answer. It looks like no, and it looks like he might not be there much longer. Although we'll know a lot more at this time next week. I'll probably make a decision within a week. Yeah, Jay, I, I respect the heck out of Ryan as a, yeah. a football mind. I, I hope he gets another opportunity if, the, if this is the end for him. But if Purdue makes a change, I mean, Jason Candle seems like a layup for them. Like that, that's like yeah. the bottom of what yeah. they could get from Toledo. But man, if I'm them, I'm going to see if Matt Campbell really wants to make the leap to the Big Ten. Like that, I'm just going to throw throw a huge amount of money. Maybe you can't get him. Maybe Matt's more patient. That, that's a that. that's a really good idea, you know. And, it, and I how long can he wait? How long can Matt wait? You know, like at some point, like we thought about Penn State, and USC. Right. I just don't know if those are possibilities for him. And you know, Purdue kind of fits him. It's right in his backyard of Ohio, so it's. I would go big if I were them and, and try. Yeah, to well, yeah. I mean, yeah, the, the the question you have to ask though is is Purdue a downgrade from Iowa State? Right. Especially with the Big the way it is now. Yeah. Well, yeah. What he's what he's built. I mean, you have a chance to to play who you play in there at, at at Iowa State. I don't I don't know for what he's built it to be. I will say this. You know, I think Ryan Walters. It reminds me a lot of Mike Loxley when he went to New Mexico. Was it? You know, maybe it was a little bit too early. Now Loxley's won a decent amount of games at Maryland and got another chance kind of got uh, a second chance with Saban as an analyst and coordinator. And maybe that happens with Ryan Walters and you hope that he, he does get another chance. Uh, I do think Matt Campbell would be an A plus higher if they were able to get him to Purdue. Uh, they might go with Candle. We had, we had bad luck with the Toledo head coach last time. I, so, so, so as Candle seems like a better football coach. He's won a lot of games at Toledo. Uh, they just would have brought the offense coordinator with at that time. One Matt Campbell, maybe. Yeah, but that, I think that was really, really obvious that uh, without Matt Campbell, uh, yeah. Tim Beckman wasn't going to have a great offense, and Toledo wanted to keep him. And obviously, Matt Campbell's gone up upwards from there. Uh, well, they've done it. Jay, Nebraska is going bowling, but Wisconsin, yikes, yikes. So kudos to Matt Rule getting that program. They finally get over the hump of sure. that, but Wisconsin falling apart. So Wisconsin has five wins. Is that correct? Five and six. Yeah. How do you get to five Ohio? and six? If Wisconsin gets beat by Minnesota, which certainly Minnesota is playing better football than Wisconsin right now, this will be the first year in 22 seasons Wisconsin doesn't go to a bowl. We're talking 2002, the year my senior year in high school. They it has been that long since they have not gone to. That's a model of consistency. Now they've had some six, seven win teams. They've also had 13 win teams in that in that era. And some really good football coaches. Guys, Luke Fickle's not getting the job done right now at the standard that Bucky wants him to get done at. Uh, certainly making a change at offensive corner. We talked about it last week. We feel really fortunate to have Barry Lunny as the offensive coordinator. When you look at Northwestern's offense, you look at Longo gone. You look at the guy, uh, he didn't get, Satterfield didn't get fired at Nebraska. I think I said that he got demoted to not play call. You know, uh, I guess he got fired from being the OC because now he's just a position coach and Holgerson took over for that. And then there was one other team that that fired their OC. I can't remember. Purdue. Which was. Purdue. Purdue. And then obviously Iowa had their OC woes for years and, you know, brought in Tim Lester, who's been a little bit better than, than Brian Ferentz, but because they've been able to run the football so well, but still having quarterback issues. So um, offense is an issue. And if you don't have it, it's really, really obvious. You have to be able to score points. We talk about scoring 30 points all the time. I thought 30 points would be enough against Rutgers. It wasn't. We need to score one more time, and that's just the era of college football we're in. Well, Jay, next week we get to talk about a bowl appearance for Illinois, where they're going, and uh, we'll talk about this Northwestern game as well. Plenty of excitement for Illinois football, that is for sure. Jay Lyman, you're the goods. We'll talk to you next week. I appreciate it. You think we'll know by next week like if they go to Citrus or not?
It'll be yeah, the two days, right? The day after, I think he gets your bowl bids. And I thought that was after, wasn't that after the Big Ten maybe championship not. game? Yeah, you're right now. So yeah. I'm, I'm just thinking about what, what could you're maybe right. happen or whatnot. It looks like we're in line. I'm not sure there's another team no. that, that could be in position. Minnesota now has five losses, I believe. Yep. And so like you uh, knocked out Rutgers, Minnesota's out. Iowa's the only other eight plus win team. So the only other teams I think could get to the Citrus Bowl would be Iowa, but they were there last year. They they'll want Illinois. Uh, the Citrus Bowl's been at like five games for Illinois. So I think that means something. Uh, but Indiana would be the only other one, right? And I still think they're gonna get to eleven and one and get to the college football play. I still don't think you can hold out Indiana. I know people are talking about oh, they, they haven't been a team with a winning record. And I and I understand that, but I would say this. They haven't just beat people. They have destroyed. Like they, their their margin of victory was like on par with Michigan twenty twenty three margin of victory, and so that has to play into a little bit. I know they didn't play against Ohio State, great, but that's what I would say. But hey, man, thanks for saying I'm the goods all the time. It's always been fun. Look forward to talking next week. See you.